What if I told you that instead of player performance, it's more the whales that control the sports card market, the collectibles markets? Let's talk about it. my sports card collectors, investors, all of my collectibles, friends, how are we? It is another day. It is another collectibles video. This is the coolest thing I have ever seen. If you're new here and your friends, family are just tired of hearing you yammering on about cards, collectible stuff because they just don't care, you have come to the right place. Please hit the big red button below the subscribe button, like if you like it, and also don't forget to tapity tap on the notification bell so you're notified of all the new videos. We come out with just about daily videos almost every day, and we are going to keep them coming. Also, connect with me on IG at Sports Card Dad, and I'm also on the Twitter, the Sports Card Dad. All right, today we are going to talk about what is the big kind of control when it comes to sports card collectibles prices. And whether you are a collector, an investor, a flipper, a trader, a hybrid, whatever you decide to call yourself, this matters to you because pricing is everything when it comes to acquiring that particular piece. If you are a collector and you are going to take that thing to the grave, they're going to bury it with you, you care about the price because if the price is high, you can't buy other things. You can't buy other collectibles. If you're an investor, obviously it matters. And if you're a flipper, trader, short-term person, it matters as well. Let me first off start off by saying I am a fan of capitalism as a whole. Is it a perfect system? No, it is not. But this is not a video bashing against either whales or capitalists because, frankly, I've seen the other side, what is not capitalism, and I don't want any sort of part of that. I enjoy capitalism, so this is not a bash on that at all. This video is meant more to help people recognize certain trends, the average folks like you, me, and others that are not necessarily operating in that 0.001% of collectibles so that we can be aware and kind of navigate the, these waters. So what is a whale? What the heck am I talking about? We're not talking about that thing in the ocean, that gigantic splashity splash thing in the ocean, but we are talking about a person or a corporation, and I got this definition just off of the Google, so bear with me. Different people will have other definitions. A person or individual that has the money or power to influence the price of a card or collectible or other financial instrument, whatever that may be. And you must be the Monopoly guy. Hey, thanks for the free parking. The crypto space gets a lot of flack for this because you'll see kind of these smaller cryptos that, you know, there's it's point zero 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 one cent is is what it is. It's like a penny stock. It's actually even less than a it's not even worth a penny. It's worth less than a penny. But what happens? You could there are times when whales move into a particular crypto, whatever that is, and then they can move that price very easily because they're just buying up so much of it. There's a narrative formed around whatever that thing is, and then they quickly move off of it. And and things can happen like this in a similar way on the sports card or collectibles side of things as well. I found a great story, and I've referenced this in the past in other videos, but it's about Oprah Winfrey, Oprah the Collector. And this is out of the Chicago Tribune going all the way back, folks, to 1990. 1990, 30 years ago. And it's very interesting because it talks about kind of what we talk about here. Oprah wanted some shaker furniture. This is antique furniture, very, very nice antique furniture. There is collectability to this to this stuff. So it wasn't as if like nobody knew what it was and then Oprah Winfrey got into it and then all of a sudden it boomed. No, this is something that was collectible back then, but the article states and shows that she came in buying the top end of the market. I believe she spent almost half a million dollars. This ended up causing a short-term spike in that particular furniture where what happens, you see kind of the high sales, those huge sales, and then others follow. You have other collectors or people that are into antique furniture, maybe not that brand, but they jump in, everybody jumps in because it's cool. Oprah's buying it, right? And that's not her intention. Her intention was not to come in and influence the market, but she did because she bought on the top end. It gets out into the media. Oh my gosh, and Oprah Winfrey, she still is a big deal. But man, in 1990, her show was just going gangbusters, highly, highly, highly popular 
figure in 19. Her show was taking off back then. So this is an ultra popular celebrity before social media. You know, so this was a big deal. And Shaker Furniture got a spike, a short term spike from that particular stuff. And that happens. You see that happen with all sorts of different things, whether we're talking about art or furniture, antiques collectibles of all types. And when you have a limited number of these types of things, it's going to cause a rush for those particular items. There's only so many to go around. So what happens? Price fluctuation. The prices are going to go up. The difference between now and 1990 is the market is more sophisticated. Collectibles, especially certain types of collectibles, have become more of an asset class. As much as collectors don't want to hear that, it's not an investment and it's not an asset class. Well, the reality is is that high-end collectibles have always been, I believe, a form of an asset class. Whether Wall Street has been involved or not involved, it's been traded at the high end for a long time. And ever since the advent of the Beckett magazine, the price guide, kind of the ultimate price guide going back to the 80s, it spurred that kind of, okay, we're keeping track of pricing now. We're, we're trying to figure out what stuff is worth, and all of that ties together. I think that the one thing that we have to really just be mindful of is that whales are operating all the time in, in many different markets. And the key is is just getting ahead of the whales, which is very difficult to do. Nobody can predict, exa- predict exactly which markets are going to rise next and all of that. But that's kind of what you see, though, right? You see a lot of people are buying into certain, you know, certain card sets certain sports, whatever it is, non-sports, because it's trying to get ahead. And then all of a sudden you get a whale that gets attached to that particular card set or that particular type of card or collectible and off you go. So it's either getting ahead of the whales or then just accepting like, hey, the whale's got a hold of this thing. I need to wait if I want to buy in. I might think this thing is really, really cool. But the reality is, is that at some point down the line, there very, very well could be a whale sell off. And that is something that uh, there's an account on Twitter. I mentioned them here over the last couple of days, M&T Trading. They keep track of a lot of like what's going on on alt compared to eBay, compared to PWCC for various cards that are on the high end or like middle tier cards that have been considered high end for a while that now are starting to see some pretty dramatic drops in price. So the the idea that, you know, the high end is is safe, we made a video on this as well, not necessarily the case. We, when we talk about kind of that 0001%, the Jordan PMG green, the, you know, the Mickey Mantle 52 tops and high grades, those sorts of things, um, you know, they might be able to weather that sort of storm, but, you know, prism golds and kabooms and uh, random other things that maybe went from, you know, a $2,000 card to a $20,000 card, $5,000 to fifty or whatever happened over the last couple of years. That's the stuff that we're looking at now. And and that's for a lot of people, that's high end for me. $50,000 is mega high end for me. But for the overall market, $50,000 is just another Herbert RPA at this point, right? And so that's the big question here that I'm, and I'm watching this. I want to see, are the whales selling off? Because yes, there could be some buying opportunities or we're moving more and more into a buying season. I mean, the reality is I think a lot of people are moving into cash. Interest rates are going up. I think that a lot of people that have been in collectibles on this high end, yes, they love certain things, but they might have bought into a lot of things and they're like, which things do I really like on this high end and which things can I get rid of? Because frankly, I'm ready to move. If there's a real estate crash coming, I'm ready to move into that. Or, hey, if equities of stocks are going to drop, I want to move into that. You know, I mean, we have to kind of be practical about this. Yes, there are people that are here that are buying into these things that have a lot of money that love the things, but not all the things. You know, they bought in because they're like, hey, I can make a few bucks on this. And now they're maybe like, eh, you know, and, and they're okay maybe taking a, a loss, doing some tax harvesting. Yeah, I'll take a little bit of a bath on this card. I've got other things I want to move into the same way that collectively collectors slash investors, flippers, whatever, will take a little bit of a bath on something to move into another card or collectible that they like. All right, guys, I thought this would be an interesting topic to cover. Stay healthy, stay awesome. I will talk to you again later.